Hey everybody, welcome to the second episode of our spinoff podcast, That Year in Comics. This year we talk about 1996. Uh, it was a great year because I graduated high school and became a man, or something like that. But no, it was a pretty good year uh, with a lot of ups and downs in the comic industry, so you're going to hear us talk a lot about that. But before you do get into that, just know this show is sponsored by two main people, and that would be our buddy Aaron Conaway, whose brand new book, Waking the Weaver, a Timberhaven novel, can be purchased on Amazon's and, I believe, the Barnes & Nobles and all of those kinds of places. So go check him out. Aaron was on the show a few weeks back, and he's one of our best friends. And it's always, you know, it's always great to support a uh, local guy trying to make it in the publishing world. And in addition to that, the other sponsor would be the Comic Cave in Springfield, Missouri, and more importantly, CaveCon 2018 coming in September. Go to CaveConSpringfield.com to learn more about that, or go to the Comic Cave in Springfield, the world's greatest comic book shop. It's true. There's a lot of great people that are going to be at the show. There's always a lot of great people at his shop, and it'll be worth checking out. Plus, uh, again, we support the people we love, and we love Josh Roberts as well, so go do both of those things. Um, that said, it's time to start the intro. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. Please, please, please tweet, complain, whatever you need to do, at PC Bombcast using the hashtag TYIC 1996, just so we know you're complaining about this one, or go back to 1986. And like Bender said, I promise we won't do 2006 next. We're going to keep it a little original. So that's it. Here it comes. Thanks. In 1938, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster created Superman. And with him, the superhero genre was born and the comic book industry was kickstarted. Now, I've been a fan of superheroes my whole life, but it wasn't until 1991 when Jim Lee and Chris Claremont relaunched X Men that I became obsessed. And while my obsession has dwindled over the years, this new series from the Pop Culture Bombcast is my way of reconnecting to what made me love comics so much in the first place. And I've brought my co-host and good friend Bender, who reconnected with his love of comics through our friendship more than 10 years ago. So join us as we break down the best of what each year in comic book history had to offer as we give you That Year in Comics. Hey, and with that, we are back in 1996. Bum, bum, bum. Where uh, were you in 96? I was graduating high school. That's one of the reasons I chose this episode. Oh, man. okay. I yeah. was in uh, sixth grade. Yeah, there's a difference there. <laughs> uh, I had had sex with women. You weren't even attracted to women at the time. Hey, I. My, I was a, no, I got my first girlfriend in sixth grade. Yeah. You guys held hands or did you kiss her? I, that was my first kiss. Oh, uh, good for you. I think her name was April. Mm hmm. Oh, man, I'm telling Dwayne. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, again, like I said, welcome back to That Year in Comics. This time we're doing 1996, but before we jump into 1996, let's dial it all the way back to 1986. Um, that was one of our most downloaded episodes uh, of all time. Really? Yeah. We got a lot of good feedback. I enjoyed it a lot. I had fun. I had a really yeah. good time. Um, what I liked about it is uh, it wasn't like we were jokey jokers and, mm -mm. or anything like that. It's just nerding out. Yeah, and that's what we're here to do. So that's what we're going to do now. Yeah. You got anything about 1986 before we jump 10 years in the future? Uh, no, go back and read that stuff and let us know if you uh, what you thought. If you uh, agree, disagree, whatever. I, I'm with you. Just I, one thing I would encourage everyone to do listening, that if you haven't read those comics that mm -hmm. we talk about in that episode and this episode and everyone going forward, mm -hmm. then I encourage you to read them. And even if you have read them, then reread them. And even read That's the, what I did. And even read the ones that we say are, are bad, just yeah. to see if you agree with us. Yeah. And, and uh, whatever you do, tweet at PC Bombcast and use the hashtag TYIC, whatever year you're, you're complaining with us or, or praising us on. So, like, last one would have been 1986. This time, TYIC, 1996. So, we're not going to 2006, are we? Not yet. No, okay. we're going to break that. Yeah, I, this is just happenstance yeah, happened okay. to be a 10-year game. I don't know if you had, like, some sort of weird game plan. No, I did not. I have no game plan. It just, uh, there was... Shoot Some from the hip. Stuff came up on 1996, so I made it, I picked it, you know? Yeah, sounds good. So that said, let's get into what was going on in 1996. As you, uh, per the last episode, I wrote down what's going on in the world, and then in movies and TV, music, and miscellaneous. So let's start with the world. First off, that was a leap year. Oh, really? Yep. See, I didn't do any of that this time. Well, I've got it for you. Let's because, and well, I'll tell you why. Because the comics that I re we read were kind of all over the board, and they didn't hold like the like same 86 dark did. theme, which there, 86 did. The society wasn't turning in 1996. Yeah. We were already grunge, and yeah. we were coming yeah. in, and right in the middle of that. So, yeah. uh, Ted Kaczynski, 
was captured, the Unabomber, for the kids that don't know. Was uh, he really? Yes. He was running around for 10 years? His first bomb was 86. Yeah, yeah he got away a long time. Uh, Billy Bailey, convicted murderer, became the first man since 1965 and stands as the last man to ever be executed by hanging in public. Hmm. Yeah. Was uh, that a request of his? I don't know. It was Texas, so I imagine they just did it. Yeah. Uh, movies and TV. We had ER and Seinfeld dominating TV, which made uh, Thursday nights truly must-see. Yeah. Uh, Independence Day dominated at the box office and changed how movies were marketed. Yeah. Um, not too far behind, though, you had The Rock, Twister, Mission Impossible, Jerry Maguire, Fargo. What a year for movies. The Rock is spectacular. I don't know if I've ever watched Fargo. At least oh. not all the way through. Jerry Maguire and Twister. If you go back and watch Twister now, it does not Oh, I, I didn't like it then, and it now is. absolutely don't. But uh, Mission Impossible, underrated. The first one was underrated. They, yeah. they got better on the third one with yeah, Philip I, Seymour Hoffman. But. Yeah, the second one was terrible. But yeah. I guess Independence Day really is like the one of the first big blockbusters. They started every... marketing it a year ahead, and that yeah. really is the way people started doing things. Yeah. Um, all of those movies, though, however, lost to The English Patient, which won Best Picture. And that stands as three hours of my life that I will never get back. And I will never watch. <laughs> you don't need to. Uh, staying with movies, though, Jim Carrey was became the first actor to make $20 million for a film. The Mask? No, Ace Ventura. <sighs> no, in 96, it would have probably been like, it may be. No, because he would have already been an established star. It might have been Liar Liar or something like that. Who knows? I'll look it up. Um Music and miscellaneous, uh, Don't Speak with the year's biggest song. That was uh, without no doubt and Gwen Stefani having that hit. We might not have Gwen Stefani and Blake Shelton today. Um, uh, Tupac like was murdered musical. and still unsolved. Uh, He's not dead. Sublime released its final self-titled or tattooed album, as some people call it, mm -hmm. marking their biggest hit, their most lucrative album, and it was uh, after the death of their lead singer, Bradney Noel. Noel. Okay. Uh, rage Against the Machine wanted to rage against all machines, including billionaires. So as Steve Forbes hosted SNL, they angered everyone and were kicked off after playing one song. Yeah, they're not allowed back anymore. That's right. Uh, do you want to know what movie it was in 1996? What is it? The Cable Guy. Oh, it's a bad movie. Yeah, it was. Uh, I wonder if that's the one he made $20 million on. The two biggest uh, toys that year were Tickle Me Elmo and the N64. Okay. Atari shut down. And cleaned house, uh, throwing away everything in the building, including the very valuable source code and notes to Centipede and Asteroids. Are you serious? Yeah. They just threw them away? Threw them away. Like, out of anger? Just didn't think about it. Let's just no throw all these shit. notes away. Cal Ripken Jr. broke Lou Gehrig's consecutive game streak. And finally, uh, sticking with a little bit of our theme, Homestar Runner debuted, would go on to be paved the way for many web-based shows and, and comics. And like I said earlier, uh, I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, uh, Strong Bad, Homestar, it, it kind of peaked before you got okay. Really older and uh, really, you'll look it up. You you'll get a kick out of watching some of those old things. Okay. Uh, and finally, like I said before, I graduated high school, which was super important. Uh, but set that bar. Yeah, yeah. Anything on uh, the year that was in pop culture before we jump into comics? No, I don't think so. I think you covered it. And like I said, I didn't do that part. So, well, let's jump right into what was going on in the right industry in, in 1996. Uh, it is often cited, 1996, the big theme of this one. We said in 86, this is when comics grew up. 96 is when comics had the great comic crash. Yeah, this was, uh, I mean, there's the ones I read are really good, but the it's just the art is just so fucking goofy well there's some goofy art but it was more bad business deals in fact yeah. you could trace the realistically you can trace the crash back to 1993 um you could almost start it you could put a pin in the very start of the crash with valiant's image crossover and image crossover deathmate yeah. in 93 um that'll be for another time if we ever do that uh, and the crash would last till about 97 when the failed heroes world acquisition by marvel uh, really called, uh, I mean, caused them to file bankruptcy at the end of 96, and then as the dust cleared, going into 97, we saw only one publisher, and that's Diamond, Co or distributor, Diamond Comics yeah. would rule all, and that's kind of what ended the comic drought, or comic yeah. crash. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but you know, not just on Marvel, some of the other reasons the crashes, the, the comics were taking a dive, and why 96 is really touted as uh, the bad year. 
Uh, consistent relaunches of series, new number one issues for everything all the time. Sounds familiar. Multiple covers causing inflated sales of issues instead of adding collectability. Okay. Pre-bagged prestige copies of key books, trading cards, and holofoil covers often used just to boost sales, and the overused shake-up stories were often used to retool comic books all the time in nineties in the mid nineties. Still going on. Trust me when I say this, yeah. it was much worse in the 90s. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember the uh, the trading cards and all the, the goofy stuff that went along with that. I ha- I still have a whole box full of, like, Marvel comic book trading cards. I loved them. I loved my favorite, and I can't, you can't get me to label which one it was, but my favorite was the one where it rated their powers on a like, oh, yeah, scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that way you could see how powerful they were. Yeah, that was cool. And for those that know what uh, Home Run Derby is on uh, baseball cards, Typically, you know, you'd buy three packs of cards. You and your buddy would go mm-hmm. in and buy three packs. You got a pack. He got a pack. You'd open them, combine your guys' home runs, and the winner got the last pack. Oh, we would do that's that. fun. We would do that with superhero powers. Whoever had the most powerful, like, fighting ability or strength, yeah, and we yeah, could yeah. do that that way. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so it was a good time. Um, sales did start off strong in 96 due to the epic and equally awful crossover event, uh, Marvel versus DC, or DC versus Marvel, depending on which one released it. I guess, we'll get yeah. we'll get into that in a little while. Uh, though the year did not hold strong, which at that combined with slagging uh, sl- uh, slagging sales led Marvel to do something it had never done before. It handed over the reins of its books to two creators, legendary creators, yeah. Rob Liefeld and Jim Lee, for the Heroes Reborn at the end of the year. And again, we're going to get into that more. That's, but, that, yeah, that was weird. And that gave it a brief bump in sales. Uh, however, the slump would come back. And like I said earlier, uh, shortly after that, December of 1996, Marvel filed bankruptcy. Yeah. Uh, very seminal event in the history of comic books. Uh, it's sales though, back to what sales were. It's hard to say what was actually the top. It's 1997 is when we, we really see accurate reporting of sales. And here's why mm-hmm. capital city tracked dot comic, which was, there was three main distributors, capital city, diamond and heroes world, mm-hmm. capital city tracked by dollars sold okay. diamond tracked by units sold and Marvel did not report. Uh, our Heroes World did not report. Since they had exclusivity, mm-hmm. they would not sell. So that said, here was what the top ten looked like. Number one was DC versus Marvel, number four. Number two was Spawn 50, followed by Spawn 43, mm-hmm. followed by Spawn 42. And it's amazing that nine issues of Spawn came out in that year because they were constantly late. Uh, <laughs> Superman, the wedding album, Gen 13, number eight. DV8, number one. Legends of Dark Claw, an amalgam book. Kingdom Come, more on that later, number four. And then Spawn 44. But here's a couple of things of note with that list. It is suspected that Marvel probably would have dominated the top ten had they reported. And it easily they probably outsold Spawn 50. Yeah. But since they didn't report, Spawn officially come in as one of the top ten sellers that year. Yeah, I mean, wasn't that the uh, Clone Saga was going on in 96? Or was that 96? Oh, and Spider Man. Yeah, mm, I didn't. I don't think it was ninety six because it didn't come up in any of my research. Okay. But that's not. That's not safe for sure. I thought it was around that time. Um, I can tell you this. Uh, we've got a little bit of help from a uh, host of the Nerdcast, Jay Tierney. I, okay. Jay, I always. I'm sure we I should have him on one of these days. We will. And I was just with him at our daughter's batting practice, and I. I know I butchered their last name, but he. You know, he put, and he's right. Spawn overload. Spawn was everywhere. They. Mm-hmm. It was a juggernaut. For Image, for a long time, maybe the first important book before The Walking Dead, but he also had the HBO series and the movie in the works at this time. Mm. So that's how good life yeah, was. Yeah, I remember for- the movie. I, actually, it did run from 94 to 96. The okay. Cold it so it must have wrapped up yeah. in, in 96. Early, yeah, probably. Uh, so here we go. Famous first for 1996. You ready? Okay. Yeah. Onslaught, uh, X-Men, and the Marvel Universe. Heroes Reborn books. Uh, one that is very underrated. Aztec, The Ultimate Man. Grant Never Morrison and Grant Morrison and Mark Miller, a great book. Um, holds holds up about what you expect out of the nineties, but still, yeah. you had Grant Morrison and Mark Miller writing. Yeah. Uh, Batman: The Long Halloween. More on that yep. later. 
Kingdom Come, and my favorite incarnation of Nightwing, which was uh, Nightwing Volume 2 with Chuck Dixon and Scott McDaniel, my favorite Nightwing artist. Okay. That was a great run of Nightwing, especially oh, really? the first 13 issues were spectacular. What, was it, what, what did that, uh, if, I was, if you were going to sell, sell somebody to go back and read it? It was Nightwing officially moving out from under the thumb of Batman, but okay. still staying uh, close as a family, so he went to Bloodhaven, which was the ugly little brother of Gotham, Okay, and tried to set up shop and be his own hero. You know, in a little bit of research that I was able to pull off, I didn't realize Nightwing was that old. I thought he came out in the early 2000s. Oh, no. He was, see, he was, uh, he changed over in the 80s in Teen Titans when they became the Titans. Yeah, see, I didn't, New I Titans. did not know that at all. Like that, I mean, that was, that was bad on my part, but yeah. I was always a Marvel kid, so. Uh, some other notes Detective Comics hit 700. Sandman ended its run at number 75, which. I've tried to read that and I can't. It's awesome. I read it, but it also was a lot easier to read it when it was new. I could see yeah. where you could lose patience on it. Yeah. But brilliant book. Mm -hmm. uh, deserve it of the acclaim. And for those that don't watch Big Bang, Neil Gaiman made a couple appearances this past week. Oh, really? It was pretty oh, awesome. Cool. Uh, Captain America was canceled after 458 issues, starting back in 1968. No shit. You know, and legendary artist and very sad, Kurt Swan passed away. He was a yeah. great Superman artist. and uh, But all that said... Let's jump to the comic book. Well, hold on, hold on. Oh, you unless you got uh, some, I'm sorry. Well, I just one of the other the one you didn't mention. I thought you would is uh, Preacher debuted. Uh, I talk about Preacher later. Oh, okay. But uh, I yeah. guess this is where we should probably compare no, no, notes. that's okay. It, it's <laughs> worth talking about. It, it's worth yeah. talking about. And um, yeah, I mean, I love Preacher. Yeah. Preacher is one of my favorite books of all time. That is not a book I would say. If you're going into it blind, know that it is super '90s with the. Yeah, the drawings, the homophobia, all of it is very, well, I very. I mean, you can't 90s. even watch Friends like you used to. No, be able exactly. To. I mean, like it, yeah. the world has changed. Yeah. But you know what? I, I don't care. It's still a great yeah. You book. have to look at it as like a uh, timepiece period or time uh, period piece now. Yeah, almost. period piece. Yeah, 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 that's what I was looking for. There you go. Uh, any any other notes you brought? No, that was uh, just the stuff for the the things we talked about. All right. Well, here you go. Here's what I've got. We're going to get to the comics. Now, like I told you in a text, I use the, uh, for me, and, and you can do this however you want. Okay. I use the Clint Eastwood method on this. I went with the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay. Uh, for 1996, because that was pretty much summed up 96 for me. Okay. Uh, so let's start off with the good, will you? Yeah. Uh, first thing I put, Batman the Long Halloween. Yeah, it was very good. Uh Written by Jeff Loeb, art by Tim Sell. It spanned from 96 and went into 97. Yeah, and it's, 13 uh, issues. Yeah, and for those that don't know, the story is um, more or less a continuation of Frank Miller and Dave Mazzuchelli's Night... Yeah, it's uh, a night, direct continuation of Batman Year, year One. Year One, yeah. Um, it served to usher in the transition, uh, the story itself, not the time period, but the story itself was kind of the bridging of when Batman really got into his rogues gallery, which yeah. were not cheesy mobsters, but more supervillains. Yeah, it was uh, Yeah, it was the early days of Batman, and it was the... Well, we're about, what you're about to say, I bet, is the other purpose is a comprehensive backstory on Two-Face. Yes. That has never been done. It tells the definitive origin and transformation of Harvey Dent into his villainous alter ego, Two-Face. And that is the most solid part of the book. I think the rest of the book is... It's okay. It's pretty oh, good. Man, I, I love it. I mean, it's good. I mean, like the art and the, the the art is spectacular. It's very noir. I just, I feel like they kind of steal the best parts of other movies and put them in comic books. Like the beginning of the book, for example. And I'm not spoiling. It's anything. the Godfather. It's the Godfather yeah. in reverse. No, you're absolutely right. And it drives me nuts. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, but otherwise, yeah. that's that's just like my big hang up. And, and we'll and get to good. we'll get to your thoughts on it as a whole. Let's break yeah. down what it was. First off, it was allegedly influenced by a conversation that Loeb had with uh, legendary and uber popular writer at the time, Mark Wade. Yeah. Apparently, Loeb told Wade that he was working on a year one story, and Wade said, "Well, you should focus on." Dent because he's been ignored. Yeah, and so this is what they come up with, and there is a lot going on. In this, like you said, the the main story and the theme of the book is not necessarily Harvey Dent to Two Face. That yeah. that's a byproduct of yep. it. But the main theme is the Holiday Killer. Yes. Um, the then Captain James Gordon, D. A. Harvey Dent, and Batman are trying to solve a mystery and track down this uh, this killer that is using the. Holidays of each month. Well, it's murder. the Calendar Man. The no, Calendar no. Man is the one that they. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the no, holiday no. killer. Yeah, yeah. We'll get to Calendar Man. Yeah, but I, I was confusing the two. Is what he's doing yes. is using themes to kill. Um, so each individual book acts as a month or a holiday, yes. which is a not. I mean, it's a great vehicle that to is, frame that your is story. Cool. 
Um, but there is, like you just mentioned, a Hannibal Lecter type relationship, which is another kind of skill. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is the reintroduction. I did not realize, but he had been gone for almost a decade. Calendar Man had been not used until See, this. See, I, 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 that was before my time, I guess. But uh, I did. That was, this is my first uh, interaction with our inter- introduction of the Calendar Man. Oh, this book, yeah. Yes. Which for most people, I'm sure yeah. it was. Um, he uh, knows who uh, Holiday is yes. in the book. Uh, but instead of giving Batman who it is, he just gives him clues for him to try to solve. Like you said, very much Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. Um, and instead of capturing Holiday, you know, trying to. The, the other part about this where there's a lot going on, instead of getting to Holiday each issue, he's obviously looking for him, but he's got his own bag of. Yeah, he, crazy to mess with. He's got he goes against Joker, Poison Ivy, Riddler, Scarecrow, Mad Hatter, uh, among others in yes. the book. Um, and one of the main story the the main story that starts the whole thing off is the war between the Falcones or Falcones and the Maronis. Yes. And uh, during an attempt to take down to the families, we'll just speed through this real quick. You mm-hmm. stop me if you got the head of the Maroni mob agreed to testify against Falcone. Yes. Okay. This at the trial. He throws a vat of acid, which is given to him by assistant D, uh, Harvey Dent's assistant, Vernon yes. Fields, thus starting his... his Descent into yeah, madness. Yeah, madness, yeah. On Labor Day, Batman captures Holiday and unmasks him as Alberto Falcone, son of the head of the family. Yeah, who had been killed back on Valentine's Yeah, Day? early in the book. Yes. Earlier in the book. And Faked his own death, obviously. So then later on in Halloween, Dent resurfaces, and now he's Two-Face, and he releases prisoners from Arkham... Uh, he murders Carmine Falcone, his yep. daughter, and Vernon, fulfilling all of his orig- his revenge and his original goal of taking down the family. Yes. Uh, he turns himself in, lets Gordon and Batman know that there was... And this is when he tells them there's actually two killers. Yeah. And this was what... I remember reading this as a kid when I was a kid. I was like, I'm reading through this great story. Or not a kid, obviously. I was a teenager. I was in yeah, college. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. But, and when it got to the end, it was like, fuck around, mind blown. It was like watching Memento for the first yeah. time for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was definitely um, a good twist. Because Alberto had confessed to being then and sentenced to uh, Arkham due to an insanity plea. Uh, my favorite my favorite thing, this is the mind-blowing part where they cut to... Again, this is all filled with spoilers, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But still go read them. So they cut to Gilda, who's Harvey's wife, and she's packing up because she's moving away on Christmas Eve, the last issue. She takes one box containing the guns and the disguise used by Holiday, and she burns them in the furnace. Yeah, and says, I still believe in well, Harvey Well, that's Dent. just it. Well, she monologues that she started killing to help her husband to ease his workload, maybe yeah. save him. Um, and then she herself came up with a theory that Alberto lied. And another great plot twist, that Harvey himself, not Two-Face, started performing the killers after New Year's Eve before yep. he was even turned into Two-Face. Um, and then, yeah, the book closes with the line, I still believe in yeah. Harvey Dent, which is... So there's definitely two, possibly three killers that's just left open into there. I think they. I think if you check Wikipedia, they say there's two. Okay. They say yeah. it's Gilda and Harvey, but yeah. I'd like to think no, that Gilda and Alberto. No, Har- Alberto. She thinks that Alberto lied. He didn't kill anybody. They, anybody at all. He attempted, and that's yeah. when he was caught. But I like. I mean, I think either way, if it's two or three, and that's one yeah. of the beauty of this book is the ambiguous ending. Yeah. Um. Very dark, like we said. We we talked a lot about Batman getting dark in '86. Yeah, but this is a pretty dark book too. I mean, there's a murder every book essentially. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, you know, drawn in that you know deep gray scales. Mm. Batman's in the blue and gray. Uh, Tim uh, Sale, who we can mind you, uh, got famous from him and Loeb doing uh, um, the color book, Superman Red and Blue. He yeah. did. Uh, uh, Before that, Daredevil he did, Yellow, Daredevil Yellow, uh, Spider Man Blue. Yeah, he did a Captain America White. Yeah, that, that took like twenty years to come out. But yeah, uh, I never that, read it. So. And, t- and he does a very much a gouache watercolor style yeah. art, and it's beautiful. It's yeah. beautiful. And uh, his the the go- I love how he draws the goons with the very heavy brows. You know, like the the mobsters all have. Like, oh, the definitely thick, the big thick noses well, like, and the heavy they brows. They look like Warner look- Brothers mob villains. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's what was cool about him. Yeah, it was cool. Um, like you said, there's a lot to unpack. Um, I, I myself, let's get to what you thought about it. I know we kind of zipped through, but we got a lot to talk about on this episode. Um, what did you rate the book overall? I rate it as good. I think it's a very good book. I think that he, you know, and for our listeners, you know, we have a six point or six pack six point system. Yeah, but so. you said good, bad, or ugly. No, no, I'm no. This I'll is, give it a four then. No, I mean, I if I put it in group one, it's good in my opinion. You can yeah. argue with that if you want, but you gave it no, a no, four. No. I think it's good. I give it a four because I think that 
it bothers like the the Hannibal Lecter stuff and the Godfather stuff kind of bothers me. Like he's, I don't know. I, I maybe he's just fanboying too out. Too on the and, nose, you think? Yeah, he just too on the nose with it. With symbolism, I but gave, it, 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 he redeems himself in the end with a twist. And I gave it a six. It's okay. a, it's a layup for me as one of my favorite Batman stories. It might have been my favorite Batman story at the time, other yeah. than Dark Knight Returns. I mean, it stands the test of time. So it was. It's ranked by IGN, IGN as the number four Batman story of all time, uh, with Dark Knight Returns, Hush, and I don't, and Arkham Asylum in front of it. Okay. Uh, All s- super solid. Television, uh, apparently Gotham this year is using some of the story. See, it, when I read it, I thought that I could see Christopher Nolan getting a little bit of his inspiration. Which is for something else I put on Dark too. Knight for this. Like, uh, not, you know, not all of it, but I know he's, he took some yeah, of it. Yeah, he said this. that some of this was part of the inspiration for his Dark Knight trilogy. Just I don't watch feel. Gotham, but it's cool that they're using some of the story. Yeah, I, I tried to watch the first season and I was out. It was I don't too it. far away. Um, all of the very awesome Batman games from 2011 on, that's Arkham, Arkham City, yeah. and yeah, uh, yeah. they all use downloadable content like car- like skins. Yeah. And parts of the story for the thing. Yeah, he definitely, I think, defined... You could correct me if I'm wrong because you know more, but I think he defined who Scarecrow was as a He made him cooler. Cooler. He was kind of cheesy. Yeah. Uh, and he made him a lot hipper of a bad guy. Yeah. And that was a great ep- uh, issue also where, you know, he finds himself on his the tombstone of his family and, yeah. and that great cover. It was, it was awesome. Yeah. Awesome stuff. I loved it. Like I said, it was... Not my favorite book of the year. Maybe my second favorite. We'll yeah. get to my favorite book here coming up. I just wanted to sandwich this next book in between my two favorite ones. So Okay. Well, before you do that, I did read also, because when I was doing my research, I had already read <clears throat> The Long Halloween. So I, I saw their 1996 books are coming out, and I, I read bon- Batman Haunted Night, which after doing a little bit more research after I read it, it's actually... Uh, 93, 94, 95. Yeah, the Halloween issues for 93, 94, 95, yeah. which I guess... Basically allowed uh, Tim Sales and Jeff Loeb to launch in and like own Batman from that point on, and they did. They did a good job on it. And they did a great. And that what this one is, it's a collection of three stories. They're real easy. The first one is Fears, and that's Batman versus Scarecrow, and he's hunt he's hunting Scarecrow down after being poisoned in a uh, yeah good book. That's very good, and he gets poisoned in a uh, in a thorn bush field. He Scarecrow tricks him into going in there, and he's poisoned, and his mind's not where it needs to be. And then they throw a second storyline in there with a uh, with a, a woman who's trying to marry Bruce Wayne for his money and then murder him. And he's fallen for it, and the poison's kind of got him off of his game. He ends up winning in the end, obviously. Well, of course, he's Batman. Yeah. Uh, the second one was uh, Madness, which this is the first time I'd ever read anything with Mad Hatter in it. And it's yeah. about... It's an okay story about uh, Barbara Gordon going missing on Halloween and the Mad Hatter stealing her and making her part of his crazy tea party. Well, Barbara Gordon needs to get her shit together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She eventually she does right. She becomes a uh, Oracle. Oracle. Well, she was Batgirl before. So yeah. She, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, I mean, Joker steals her and then shoots her and yeah, or doesn't steal paralyze her, her. paralyze her and makes yeah. her Oracle. Yeah. 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 And then the last one, which I thought was super weak, and another complaint on Tim Sales and Jeff Lowe for me. It's just basically a Christmas story, but in Halloween version. Yeah. Where Thomas Wayne is uh, is uh, Jonathan Marley, and uh, Poison Ivy is the ghost of past. Joker's the uh, the ghost of the present, and the Grim Reaper, which is the manifestation of dead Batman, is uh, is gross the ghost Christmas of Christmas future. future. Yeah. And it was I read it and I was like, this is fucking awful. <laughs> I still enjoyed it. But I mean, I I mean it. the art's yeah. good and it's pretty, but if you read Long Halloween and then you read that afterwards you're like jesus christ <laughs> the uh, it was bill long halloween is billed as a sequel to that but if you read them the yeah. timeline doesn't make sense exactly because uh two faces in i think he's in madness yeah one of those yeah uh reread long halloween recommended it. it's a couple i times. would reread long halloween every halloween yeah it's worth it it's yeah. a great book um you got another one you want to throw out before I get to my next no, one? No, no, no. Go ahead. Here's the next one I've got. This is uh, I know this is going to surprise a lot of people that I've got it as a good, but I really enjoyed this at the time, and that's why it's put on here. And this was the X-Men Onslaught series, uh, uh, the whole saga. So way back in 1992, in Uncanny X-Men number 287, that book is really gave us two things to canon. One, it gave us the origin of Bishop. And it gave us the first mention of the x Trader. So at the end of it, there's a garbled message from Jean Grey that says that essentially someone's killing the X-Men, and yeah. it was one of us. 
Oh, and yeah. And it's cut out, so you know. So for four years, they you guess and you speculate. And Wizard would always have these articles of who is the X-Trader, blah, blah, blah. They, well, wait, they drug that out for four they years? They really did. So... Well, here, here's who it was. So, first appearing as a cameo in X-Men number 15, which was in May, and his full appearance came in X-Men volume 2, which was in June, number 53. Uh, the character was co-created by writer Scott Lodell, Mark Wade, and artist Andy Kubert, uh, and it was he was introduced as a villain that was part of the effects between 1993's very famous fatal attraction where Wolverine saw his adamantium ripped out by Magneto. Yep. Which is why this happened. Onslaught introduction into the X-Men caused its own crossover event across multiple Marvel titles, including Fantastic Four, X-Men, Uncanny X-Men, and Cable. Now, here's who Onslaught is, if you don't know it. Yep. He is the sentient psionic entity created by the consciousness of Professor X and Magneto. Now, chew on that for a little bit. Yeah. When Magneto famously ripped out Wolvie's adamantium, Xavier, outraged, countered by using his telepathic ability to shut down Magneto's mind, rendering him canatonic. Unfortunately, all of Magneto's bad juju entered Xavier's consciousness, and combining with every bad thought the professor had ever had his entire <laughs> life, created this entity known as Onslaught. And that is every X-Men story summed up in its, you know... Craziness. He is, yeah, he is the physical manifestation of almost every bad X Men plot. Yeah, and, uh, but it's... it, but I enjoyed it, and here's why: because he first off, you get an episode or an issue where Onslaught on the cover or Juggernaut is unconscious and, and been beaten, and no one can stop the unstoppable Juggernaut. Mm -hmm. Well, off panel, Onslaught can, uh, so he beats up Juggernaut pretty bad, whips him, and takes over a Sentinel base, and he downloads the specs for the mutant hunting androids that you know we yeah. that mm -hmm. have been plaguing X Men forever. Uh, he goes on to try to convince Jean Grey to join his cause, and offered her the power a power that rivaled that of the Phoenix Force. He also used a creepy, got in her mind to use a creepy thing to where he showed her that the professor when they first met mm -hmm. had these. Uh, urges. Emotional urges towards her, erotic urges, which was creepy because she was a teenager. Yeah, when he that's her. weird. Yeah, so I don't, I don't, I don't want to unpack that one at all. I want to keep <laughs> that one in the box. Uh, I'm gonna say Mark Wade put that in after <laughs> taking full <laughs> possession of Professor's mind and body. Onslaught as Xavier called together the X Men to turn the, and tried to convince them to turn into soldiers to fight a war against humans. Of course, they said no because we're good guys. Yeah. So he revealed himself to the X Men and tried to destroy Bishop because he knew that Bishop men knew who the traitor was yeah. and all this stuff, you know. Um, and then it turned out that that was Xavier as Onslaught that was doing all that. So they, they obviously got him out of there. Bishop rescued his teammates, but Onslaught escaped, taking Xavier's body with him. Onslaught's now free, bouncing around the world. He creates a childlike projection named Charles, and he buddies up with the other most powerful person in the universe at the time, Franklin Richards. Yeah. Uh, he captures Franklin and X-Man, who is, those that don't know, X-Man is the future love child of Scott and Jean yes. before he turns to Cable, yes. and Cable's the other love child that comes back in time to be an X-Man. Very, very good. Yeah. So there's two of them running around. You guys, you guys writing this all down? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Onslaught, or so, uh, Onslaught returns to New York with reprogrammed Sentinel robots, using them as a protective circle around Manhattan, and that was a great visual for me, watching in that issue in yeah. the book. Uh, sealing off that island from the rest of the world. The X-Men, the Fantastic Four, and Avengers all have to team up, team up to take down Onslaught. They manage to rescue Xavier and reduce Onslaught to a mass of psionic energy trapped inside his ar arm armor. And sadly, this meant Xavier couldn't use his super brain to take control of Onslaught. Yeah, because it's Magneto's... Yeah, armor it's, it's, that he can't penetrate or right. whatever. And during the next fight, Jean used her mega mind. This is my favorite part. Mega to, mind. Her mega mind to unlock the Hulk's most primal inner, inner uh, rage. Okay. So now we have a super Hulk yes. who is just pure emotion, <laughs> and he tears apart the on. He takes it to onslaught and okay. whoops, whoops him silly. But you're bad, Hulk. It creates an explosion of psionic inner energy that separates Banner from the Hulk. That's okay. important here in a little bit. Yeah. Onslaught was left as an energy being, immune to all physical harm, and using Franklin's powers, he creates a second sun that is going to destroy all of the heroes and Manhattan. Uh, Thor, being the super do-gooder of himself, decides that he's going <laughs> to 
fly, you know, to save it, he's going to fly directly into the psionic energy. Okay. Just guns a blazing because that's... He's not really a thinker, so... No. Well, but it seemed to work. So the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, all enter the field, sacrificing themselves to save the day. Now, here's another great plot part. The (laughs) X-Men were unable to jump in there because they deduced that being mutants themselves, getting in there would allow Onslaught to join, take one of their bodies, and become an unstoppable force. Again. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Uh, He dissolves, seemingly destroyed, along with the heroes that had thrown themselves into the rift. So if you're keeping track at home, it's the four Fantastic Four. It's the entire team of Avengers at that point, which was like Captain America, Iron Man, um, Thor, obviously. Yeah. Uh, Black Panther? uh, Yeah, well, uh, Bruce Banner, David Banner. He goes in and the Hulk doesn't. Okay. So he because yeah, they're split. They're now. split in two now at this point. So he goes in. Um, it would turn out though that they had not died uh, because uh, they'd cut, for one. Uh, Franklin Richard created a par- pocket universe for him. We're going to get to that pocket universe later. Uh, but that, just so you know, that that, that did so we thought defeated onslaught. He would come back in two thousand six. Um, in a miniseries, yeah. Yeah, and I got to tell you. The whole thing was, like you said, just an X Men. It was just as was X Men as a game. Yeah, it's yeah. dripping with X Men. <laughs> you can't get any more X Men. The only way you could get more is if Wolverine had a cover, a yeah. splash page where he freaks out and slashes Sabretooth. Yeah, did he go berserker? Way. I'm sure he did. Yeah, that's he what has he to, does. Right? Well, at this time he was feral Wolverine because he didn't have his metal. Oh yeah. Yeah, he was all bone and he was acting like a dog or whatever. Yeah, very awesome story. <laughs> It looked amazing because Kubrick can draw his ass off. Yeah. Um. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you. I want to know your rating on it before I keep going. If you were to rate it, just pure ridiculousness and how dumb it is, and for fun you have to go back and read it. I give it a four. I'm gonna give it a four. Also, I so I I went back and read as much as I could. Yeah. And I enjoyed it, but I couldn't read it all again. No, it's it's hard. That's like going back and reading. Uh. But at the time, it was the X Men's traitor. Yeah. It was Charles as a bad guy for yeah. whatever reason. Um, it was Hulk being Hulk. You yeah, know, they had everything I needed. I mean, it was, it, it, yeah. I mean, it was everything that made the cartoon in the '90s great. It, it, it was everything that was over the top and ridiculous. And you didn't think too much about it then, but now you go back and you're like, get the fuck out of yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so here's some uh, some of the famous spinoffs of that in pop culture. They did have a video. Uh, a lot, Onslaught popped up in a lot of video games. He was the boss character in Marvel vs. Capcom, Clash yeah. of the Superheroes. He appears as a villain character in the Marvel Superhero Squad online game, which is the the like My, yeah. Fisher Price looking yeah, Marvels. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and Red Onslaught is also a raid boss in the newest MMO Marvel Universe Heroes game. Okay. So, yeah. I so mean, he lives on. Yeah, he lives on, and you know, we there's I've got some other stuff on him later. I want to get to when we're done. But yeah, there this was. Oh, a year-long self-contained store. Well, not self-contained. Yeah. A massively sweeping store, which they do all the time. Yeah. But this was how powerful the X-Men were at the time. It wasn't like a Marvel story. It was an X-Men story that took over the whole Marvel yeah. universe. Because that's what X-Men did. They were the most lucrative thing Marvel oh, had Oh, absolutely. The and it was easy. Like, if you go back and listen to the Stan Lee, you know, it was easy just instead of creating characters. And how did this guy get his powers? Like, oh, you're born with them. You know, like, so that was spectacular. Uh I loved the X Men as a kid. I I read all. Wolverine was my go to favorite character. Is Wolverine and Spider Man? So yeah, I mean, what are you gonna anything X Men? I was in, you know. But yeah, it was just it's just cheesy. Yeah, we we don't have to spend more time on it. That was one of my favorites. But the artwork is great. It's very much the most like sex exploitation. Uh, Like the dudes are all overly ripped, and the chicks are overly voluptuous. And Kubert's come a long way. His art was great then. It's even better now. Yeah, and I'm not knocking him. That was just the time. Oh, the art of the time. Women had big boobs and very little brains. Yeah. Um, Well, Gene had the super brain. That was when Marvel had the uh, the swimsuit issues and all that. You gotta love it. Yeah. For no reason. Ridiculous. Everyone was doing it. Valiant had them. Image had them. Everyone had them. Uh, The 90s were a good time. But let's speak (laughs) into the best time of the 90s. Okay. Here, in my opinion, was the single best series of 1996. Okay. That would be Kingdom Come. I will agree with you. I never read it until last week. Oh, this is going to be good then. Yeah. Let's jump into it. Okay. Uh, Four-issue miniseries published under the Elseworlds imprint. Yep. uh, Written by Mark Wade and drawn by and hand-painted by Alex Ross. Yeah, it was... That's... 
Like you can't if you don't even read it, just go look at the art. I mean, every page is like a Renaissance painting. And there and there's a lot to a lot to ch- to follow. There's Easter eggs all over this yeah. book. Uh, when Ross was working on Marvels back in '94, another amazing book. If you've never read it, that was the direct inspiration. Yep. He well, he decided to create a similar book for DC. He wrote a 40 page out- outline of what would become Kingdom Come, and he pitched it to the uh, DC. Mm-hmm. Uh, he actually pitched it to James Robinson, who was doing Starman at okay. the time, which was a very good book. Um, he was selling it to a sim- as a similar idea as Watchmen, Alan Moore, also Alan Moore's other big Marvel book, or DC book, I'm sorry, that never happened, Twilight of the Superheroes. We'll discuss that if we ever do an 87 episode. Okay. Uh, ultimately, Ross teamed up with the writer Mark Wade because at the urging of the uh, DC editors, because Mark Wade had this uncanny knowledge of DC Universe. Yep. Um, unparalleled, they say. There was a great article I remember in Wizard from the time, uh, and the reason I remember it is because he claimed to know Clark Kent's social security number. Now, some of the people at DC said, I don't even remember that. And he swears up and down, and he had to prove to him that there's an issue where you see it. No shit. And apparently he's the only guy at the time that remembered it. So That's that was, hilarious. That was his... He That's walked pre-internet in and, stuff. Yeah, he walked in and mic dropped and then yeah. walked out, you know. Uh, the story goes like this. Here's what happens. Uh, the Justice League abandoned their role as superheroes after the rise and strong public, public support for a superhero named Magog. Uh, Magog it kills like it's paying him money. Yeah. This is his big claim to fame. No, most notably, in a flashback, he kills the Joker, who was on his way to trial for the mass murder of the Daily Planet staff, including Lois Lane. Which that's not revealed, and I think that's important to note. That's not revealed until like issue th- two, like near the end of issue two, maybe three. I read it as a companion, yeah. but it's not in the first issue. So for a while, you're like, why did everybody just walk away? Right. I don't really get it. Superman's got a ponytail. It's, yeah, it's just bad. It's a whole thing. Well, so like that, as does happen with impressionable youth, the Noah and younger generation of superheroes start mimicking Magog and not the rest of the heroes. Yeah. And the lines of hero and villainy begin to blur. That's kind of a central theme of this book. Um, the narrator of the book is a minister named Norman McKay who receives an apocalyptic vision of the future from a dying Wesley Dodds, which is Sandman, and not Neil Gaiman Sandman, but actually Silver Age Sandman. Yeah, he's the... Uh, the two-gun-toting guy with the gas mask. Yeah, and he's like the... Uh, he's like Jesus, our judo-Christian's uh, get judgment on, our, on Earth. Like, he represents uh, the judo-Christian God on Earth, what I read. The Sandman, you Wesley no, not the same name. Uh, the, the Spectre. The Spectre. Does. Yeah, Spectre yes. is the wrath of God. That's yes. what his spell. Yeah, but Sandman is who gives him this. Yeah, this, he sees the future. Yeah. So yeah. then the Spectre, whom you mentioned, appears to McKay, who's also one of the most powerful characters in all of comics, and recruits him to help pass judgment on the pro- approaching superhuman apocalypse. Um, obviously, things get out of hand because Magog screws up an attack on the parasite and blows up much of the Midwest. Killing millions and destroying a large portion of America's food production. This is yes. this was a bad deal. Uh, convinced by Wonder Woman, Superman returns to Metropolis and reforms the Justice League. Here's where it go. Here's where it starts to speed. We're gonna speed up a little bit. He, re- okay. he recruits heroes like his old buddies, like all of them except Batman, because uh, Batman resents Superman for leaving in the world in the first yep. place. And his response to Superman's Justice League is to activate his own network of agents called the Outsiders. A lot of great Easter eggs on this stuff. Yeah. A lot of great just nods to past books, 60s, 70s. It's what Wade does. Mm-hmm. Uh, this this uh, group of heroes has made up the younger generations as well as his lieutenants, Green Arrow and Blue Beetle. And uh, was it a Canary was in there, too, I believe. Yeah, I yes. believe she was, yeah. And so, meanwhile, Lex Luthor's getting in the game with the Mankind Liberation Front, or the MLF. It's a group that is secretly a bunch of Golden Age villains made up of Catwoman, Riddler, Vandal Savage, and third-generation build villains like Ra's al Ghul's successor, and I cannot pronounce this guy's name, so don't even give me, but I'm going to give it Ibn al-Zufash. Yes. I don't know. Who is the love child of Bruce Wayne and Talia al Ghul? Um, later in the comics, they would He's call Damian. him Damien, but yeah. this is essentially what Damien was before that. Mm-hmm. Of course, the MLF are in the works to take control of the world for themselves and not help the heroes. Um, Why would they do that? Yeah, that would be stupid on their part. So Superman's Justice League starts to round up everyone and their brother that looks wrong at them and lock them up in a prison named the Gulag. Yep. Obviously, as if history could tell us anything, this is a dumb idea because yep. it is quickly filled capacity almost as soon as it's built. Superman works to persuade his inmates, uh, the inmates, uh, that their methods are wrong and dangerous, which, of course, 
they don't listen because hey, kids these days. Yeah. Uh, with uh, with hot headed heroes and villains all locked up together, you can imagine that the powder keg begins to rumble, which makes Batman and the Outsiders pull the wool over the MLF and join to stand as a united front against the Justice League because Batman's trickier. Yep. Uh, Luther sees this as an opportunity to seize power with the gulag starting to blow. And then Batman uses Martian Manhunter to discover that an adult Billy Batson is under Luther's control. For those that don't know, Billy Batson is the human form of Captain Marvel, who is the only one that possesses the testicular fortitude to go toe to toe with Superman at this there point. You go. Uh, the gulag's inmates riot and kill Captain Comic. This start, this causes Batman to unleash his trichinery on Luther and reveal that he intends to use the mind. Oh, Controlled uh, Batson to break, or Luther reveals that he's going to use a mind controlled Batson to break over in the gulag. So Batman springs his trap and Luther, uh, on Luther and his posse, uh, and Bat- Batson transforms the crap Captain Marvel and flies off. Yep. Wonder Woman leads her army again, uh, uh, and the Justice League to the superhuman uh, prison riot. Superman confronts Batman, who says that all the meta unions should eat shit and destroy each other, and he's got no time for it. Yep. Uh, to which Superman waxes philosophical and points out that if all life is sacred, then logically that includes superhuman life, which is a really good line. Yeah, that's a good point. Really good point. Superman's words touch a brother, and Batman tells Superman that Captain Marvel is under Luther's control and he's on his way to the Gulag. So Superman races to the Gulag, but gets bitch slapped by Captain Marvel. The Gulag is breached, free, uh, freeing the population, and war between Woman and Woman's Justice League and the Meta Union prisoners is on. Yeah. At this point. Our, our narrator and the Spectre, Norman and Spectre, look on Wonder Woman's League and uh, engages the prisoners, and Superman is kept at bay by Marvel. Batman and his crew arrive just in time uh, to help get shit in check. Batman is unable, though, to stop Wonder Woman from killing the supervillain Von Batch, which makes matters much worse. This causes the UN Secretary General to launch three tactical nuclear warheads at him. Uh, Batman and Wonder Woman see it the incoming stealth and stealth bombers piloted by Blackhawk Squadrons, which is another cool nod. Yeah, it's a throwback reference. And break off to fighting to stop the two bombs. Marvel uses magic lightning bolt as a weapon against Superman repeatedly. It's a cool scene where he keeps saying yeah. Shazam and knocking yeah. him down. Superman manages to grab Marvel at the exact same time Bolt hits him, which transforms Marvel back into Batson. And then it gives him the super shush with the mouth, the hand to the mouth, and tells him that he's going to go stop the remaining bombs. Another great scene. Batson makes a choice, though. He can either stop Superman and allow the warheads to kill all the metahumans or let Superman go. Instead, he uses door number three, grabs Superman, flings him to the ground, utters the word Shazam, and takes out the bomb uh, with his lightning killing himself in the process yep. uh ultimately good pick one very iconic famous pick it does not kill superman um, oh, yeah yeah where he's on his knees yeah well smoke. we'll get to that that's right despite marvel sacrifice most of the meta humans are obliterated but double tough superman is there on his knees with the smoke around who is batshit crazy at this yeah. point and does not realize there are other survivors so he flies at super speed to the UN, where he is going to bring the building down on top of them and make them pay for what they've done. Uh, this is when Norman McKay pops up, and he helps point out that bringing uh, that his appearance and behavior is exactly the reason the humans are fearful of super people with superpowers. Yep. He gets through to Superman, he chills, and hands them Marvel's cape. He tells the UN that he will use his wisdom to guide rather than lead mankind. And Superman ties Marvel's cape to a flagpole and raises it to flags for the other human nations. So it becomes an official flag of the UN, yep. which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, in the epilogue, we see the heroes are fully integrated members of the community. Wonder Woman's exile from Paradise Island ends, and she takes all the survivors from the Gulag back to Paradise Island. Batman abandons his crusades and becomes a healer, turning the uh, mansion into a, ho- uh, a hospital for wounded. He... Uh, Men's Bridges with Dick Grayson, who now is going under the name Red Robin, and his son, Ibn Abba uh, And uh, so the Bat family is back together. Yep. Superman begins a task of restoring Midwestern farmlands and comes to terms with the past as Clark Kent, accepting a pair of glasses from Wonder Woman, and then we see a big super kiss mm. before she returns to Paradise Island. You know, at this point, Superman can move on. I mean, look, yeah, Lois was murdered by Joker. Yeah. He wants to get some super chances. I mean, it's, been, it's while. been a couple years. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, Norman McKay re- resumes spreading the good word and preaches among the hope of, among humanity. And that's the uh, among the corrugation is Jim Corgan, who is the Spectre's human host. Um, all in all, a story about hope, 
Um, we'll get to some of uh, Jay's thoughts from Nerdcast here in a little okay. bit. Um, but well, you left out. So is that where where you read it? It ends. That is where it ends. Well, what I when I read it, I read it from the the app and the download, and it Batman and uh, at Batman and Lois or uh, Wonder Woman and Superman all meet in a diner. Oh, t- at the very end. That's right. At the very, very and there's end. The, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. And then the, the diner is all of the... Um... Yeah, it's in Kansas or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's and, right. Uh, yeah, they're in a diner, and uh, Superman and uh, Wonder Woman say, hey, we got something to tell you, and Batman goes, you're pregnant, And then, which I think might be the best line in the whole thing. Is she, and they're like, how'd you know? He's like, well, you've gained a couple pounds. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, and that would go on to uh, set up, well, a different story. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I just thought, you know, you got to... I yeah, yeah, that that's right. It's, it's a very hopeful, optim. It's here's why it's such a good story. Then in the day and age of the movies being yeah. DC Universe movies being so fucking dark, here's a story that has as dark as a turn as you can get with nuclear war. Yeah, but it's all hope. It's all upbeat and, and sunny. When you're given like the description, like you said, there's key things that you just like we talked about with the the Joker killing uh, Lois Lane. Uh, and taking out the Daily Planet, and then Magog coming down and just laying waste to him, just not letting him go on trial and making that choice. And then you see society through this spectacular artwork kind of turn on Superman and say, this is, why didn't you guys do this before? You know, this is what we want. But yeah. That's just, that choice right there echoes in a whole new era of superheroes that just don't care about... The, the line between good and bad is blurred, and it just becomes... Uh, I hate to get too cliche, but it you know these themes resonate now with our politics in our country now. I mean, it's 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 a well written book. It stands when it was put out. It was coming out. It was people were arguing, "Is this one of the greatest comic books of all time?" I think they were comparing it to Watchmen. They were like, "Which is better?" I mean, it's. I mean, and this is only four four issues. Four fucking issues, dude. And well, then not only that, but like. The confrontation between Superman and Magog, that Magog or Magog, however you say yeah. it, you didn't even get through that. But like, he's the guy who basically replaced Superman, yeah, and then has goes on and does battle and takes out, you know, basically the Midwest on accident, and then has to live with that guilt. And they're about to go toe to toe in battle, but Magog, Mag- Magog is just so broken and busted from like his actions and his choices to take it that step yeah, further it literally the, uh, through everything he does parts of his soul are killed and yeah. then he he just can't come back from it it's just it's a, the whole story is about humanity and how there is a there needs to be a higher power and that higher power needs to hold the line yeah. no matter this how, is a world it, uh, it's a war it's about people needing to look to a higher power for yeah. guidance it just so happens that the higher power they're looking at in this this world is, is actual superheroes. gods yeah. yeah they're they're god among men so uh that said i don't think we really need to get into it too much but review and rate that's a six out that's of six. solid and six out of six <laughs> I'm going to go back and read the Marvels now just oh, because it's, it's beautiful it inspired it too. Yeah. But, I mean, even if you don't care about heroes, if you just like spectacular art, you know, watercolor art, it's just every page. But his isn't watercolor. No, yeah, it was. It no. was uh, a... Not, that's not watercolor. It was called like something with a G. I looked it up. Uh, you're thinking of the gouache. That's it. Yeah. But it's used. It, I thought when I read about gouache, it said something about like uh, being done with watercolors or whatnot. Yeah. Uh, well, I could be wrong. Either way, that's not important. Um... Anyway, so some of the other things about it is Kingdom Come characters uh, would pop up again throughout comics for the next umpteen years. Uh, Kingdom, Thy Kingdom Come, Justice League uh, Generation Lost, Superman Batman had uh, that. Uh, It's the inspiration for an audio play. 272-page companion from Harbor Press, trading cards, DC Direct action figures. I mean, this thing's... It was for a good... Near ten years, you yeah. know, one of the, the the moments in all of comic books. I and mean, Superman has a ponytail. I just want to reiterate that. that just, yeah, it could not get past. That was that is the one thing I just don't think holds up. Well, Superman have, with a fucking he ponytail. He doesn't have time to shave, and, and it did, I just it threw me off. Uh, I liked how they did the old Batman though. How his his body's kind of broken down. And he's got like the metal assisted stuff. I thought that was pretty cool. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, and they, which they kind of, like you said, and uh, uh, Tim Nolan or Christopher, Christopher Nolan, Nolan yeah. kind of stole some of that, and he yeah. had to get a little bit of that in the in the Dark yeah. Knight, the yeah, last yeah. one, the awful one. But uh, um, I mean, yeah, it, it's a six out of ten. It's still pretty good. 
No, it's six out of six, you mean. Yeah, a solid yeah, six, six out of six. Or ten out of ten. Whatever scale you're using, it's yeah, it. yeah, yeah. It's at the top. It's still one of the best things. It's very worth reading again. Um, I'll, I'll tell you real quick what uh, Jay said about okay. it. Okay. Uh, for those that don't know, Jay has a, a yeah, throw com- to Jay. He's got a com- or a, po- a podcast called Nerdcast, and he also does a on the the website. His website, Nerdcast dot com, I believe, is it. He does you know his own uh, editorial pieces. He he gave number one of his night things in nineteen ninety six was Kingdom Come, uh, and he put the underlying message of this book is hope, and it stands up more than ever twenty years later. Said so I read read he goes I even went back and reread the book after nine eleven and it's just something I pull out all the time when I needed to, you know needed to be a good pick me up. Uh, that said, for as good as it is, there's also bad in this world, and we're oh, going to get yeah. to some of the bad. Uh, Are we my, moving on now? We're moving on. Unless you got something to talk about. No, I just I can't reiterate. And I like I said going into this when we started to do this, I didn't read much DC short of Batman. We're gonna we're gonna blow through this bad. Because we're almost at an hour. Okay. So we're moving. But uh, uh, I've got a bad, then I've got the ugly. Okay. And, and so okay. here's the bad. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marvel and DC, for doing this. The fans needed this, but it wasn't. It was just poor execution. That is DC versus Marvel, or Marvel versus DC. Yeah. And eventually Amalgam, which we're going to get to at the end. Uh, if you don't know, this was written by Ron Mars and Peter David, drawn by Dan Jurgens and... Claudio Castellini, and by the way, Dan Jurgens is the man that killed Superman. Uh, it was four issues long. Not going to get too much into it because just so you know that the, the it's about two godly brothers that represent Marvel and DC become aware of each other and decide to gamble their existence. And they on, look like giant transformers. It's awful. Uh, and they choose their uh, their contests by champions of each of the world. Uh, yes. And I think it should be known that the fans voted for this. Is why it's no, no, no. Six voted, fan voted. Yeah. There's, so there's 11 battles. And I've got Five were picked by the publishers, and then six were voted on by the fans. And the fans voted on the outcomes. Yes. And they had their items. So here yes. are the battles. And I'm going to give you the battles and the winners. Aquaman yeah. Namer. Aquaman. Aquaman. Winner by whale, because that's retarded. Uh, elect- wait, 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 wait. The re- re- reiterate that. He calls upon a whale. To flatten him. Which... Whales are mammals, I'm just saying. And Namor can pick up mountains and throw them, but yeah. this well flattens him. Uh, <laughs> he can't move, therefore Aquaman is dubbed the winner. Electra versus Catwoman. Electra wins the girl fight, which I have no problem with. She's an assassin. Yeah. Flash versus Quicksilver. Flash is just faster, and that's why he wins, I mean, which yeah. makes sense, too. He's essentially the god of speed yep. at this point. Uh, my favorite of all the fights, Robin versus Jubilee, and Robin win via cape distraction. So, yeah, everything I read about, because I didn't read all of these as a kid, and everything I read about this one was basically them two fought because they had to. They were about to bang, then had to fight, and then basically almost banged at the end yeah. of the fight. Yeah, so it's sense. ridiculous. Here's the most... Uh, Impressive fight, I think, of it. Silver Surfer versus Green Lantern. That would be the world's ultimate weapon against the world's ultimate power. And Surfer comes out because he's super badass. Um, he survives the collision, which uh, makes a massive explosion, and it just doesn't kill him because he's tough. Yep. Thor versus Captain Marvel. Thor, well, because he's a god. Uh, Superman versus Hulk. Superman wins by three panels. Doesn't make sense. Uh, I don't mind Superman beating Hulk, just not in three panels. No, no, no. So I read all about this because it's a big controversy. This was the separated, not uh, ultimate Hulk rage. He was the Bruce Banner Hulk. Although they don't say a word of that in the comic. Well, that's how later <laughs> fans have justified. Okay, yeah, this that's the, the fans don't need to justify bad books. Okay, Super or Spider Man, and one of the my favorite Spider Man versus Superboy. Yeah, Spidey wins by being better at wearing a leather jacket because Superboy puts it over his outfit and it just looks stupid. That's a very nineties outfit. Yeah, it very much. Is. Uh, Batman versus Captain America. Batman wins by battering induced drowning because that's stupid. Yeah, it was draw. It, what I read, it's it came to a draw. He was awarded the winner by that. Yeah, he was. Uh, because he pulls out Captain America, who almost drowns. Yes. Therefore, he's rewarded the winner. By the way, me and we, this sparked endless rage from me and Dwayne because head to head in a fist fight, Batman has no chance against Captain America. Yeah, not in a total. It's essentially fist fight. Bane with a brain yeah. whooping Batman's ass. Now, Batman with planning, Batman being Batman, I'll give it to him. But these yeah. two just stumble across each other and fight. Yeah, if they fall into one another, they fight. 
Yeah, there's no, no way. chance. Uh, here's the lamest of the lame in this: Wolverine versus Lobo. Essentially, someone that can go toe to toe with Superman versus a dude with metal claws. Yeah, and Wolvie wins off panel. Yeah, they don't even show it. Stupid. Uh, Storm versus Wonder Woman, and Storm's the winner of this because X Men at the time. Yep. Uh, this gives Marvel a six to five win. But wait, before Entity can coll- or the Eternity can collapse on itself, and DC fades into oblivion. Yeah, because that was the whole thing. Whoever won this had to disappear. Except they don't, because a new I guy know. called Access, who is joint owned by the two, he can exist in both companies. Saves the day and fuses the universes together with the help of the Spectre and the Living Tribunal. Spectre again, yep. uh, and that gives us amalgam. Uh, Which Living Tribunal is just. Marvel's version of Spectre. Well, he's got three heads, three faces. Um, his first 12 issues of Amalgam released following, uh, the following week, delaying both publishers' uh, regular releases by one week. Half of the comics in the event were published by Marvel, half by DC. And then again in 97, another 12 were released one year later. Um, the cooler ca- coolest character of Amal- the Amalgam, the tw- first 12, was, I think, Doctor Strange Fate. Obviously, our, arguably one of the most powerful characters ever made. It was Doctor Strange and Doctor Fate. Yeah. See, I don't know who Dr. Fate is. Uh, He's essentially Dr. Strange of the DC Universe. Okay. Um, The next coolest wasn't until 97, and if we ever do 97, we'll talk about Lobo the Duck. It's one of my favorite single issues of a comic ever. Okay. Uh, See, I thought the idea of Iron Lantern was pretty cool. Oh, God. That's awful. (laughs) I just think it's a cool idea. (laughs) That's so bad. I I didn't didn't read the comic, but I I I'm on your side. It's just so (laughs) bad. It's just so bad. It's just... Uh, Storm and Wonder Woman combined together was okay. Superboy Spider Man, I just thought was stupid. Yeah. Oh, super stupid. Super stupid. Nothing great about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The, uh, Captain America and Superman basically take the best looking guy in the world and make him blonde. And he then. <laughs> yeah, give him a shield. <laughs> and give him a shield, because that makes sense, too. Yeah. Laser eyes and a shield. You don't fucking need the shield. You're. You know, impenetrable, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so that was the bad. That was one of the bads. Um, I got to, yeah, uh, yeah. I can't even. I, I bought this. I bought them all. Did you really? Of course I did. It was nineteen ninety six. Okay, okay, I was okay. in college. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, so you bought them in ninety six. That's fine. I was gonna say, did you buy like the compendium later on? No, no, no. no I okay. hated it. I, I do own. Uh, JLA versus Avengers. I do own the absolute okay. edition of that, but that's Kirk Busick's art, and it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, not, I'm sorry, uh, Kirk Busick's writing, but it's uh, George Perez's art, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, but you want to get to the ugly? Yeah. Let's get to the ugly. Real, let's do let's it. Let's blow through the ugly. This would be Marvel's Heroes Reborn. Yes. This yes. is the worst thing to have. I didn't even like it at the time. In '96, oh, really? I didn't even like it at the time. See, I could not. I, I all cards on the table. I did not read this because I can't fucking find it. Uh, you 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 won by not finding. <laughs> uh, so we don't we don't need to get to the stories very much, but I'm going to give you kind of the outline of what happened. So this was a temporary one year outsourcing of the story arc that Marvel allowed to be handled by uh, their former superstars Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld. Uh, the four books were the characters that had sacrificed themselves. So it was the Avengers, Fantastic Four, Doctor Doom, and Hulk. We forgot to mention Doom earlier. Yeah. Uh, the pocket universe where they were transported has been dubbed the Franklin verse. Jim Lee and Wildstorm took the reins on the Fantastic Four and Iron Man, while Liefeld's Extreme Studios took Avengers and Hulk. So nineties. Literally, the only way you can get me to hate the Hulk is to give it to Rob Liefeld. Yeah. Um, citing underwhelmingly low sales for Liefeld's half of it, his contract were terminated, and the six issues were given to Lee and Wildstorm to finish. Uh, Though slated for 12 issues, James Robinson wrote a 13th issue for each book called World War III, which saw the Franklin-verse characters from Marvel swear off against the Wildstorm because one crossover to get them here wasn't enough. Yeah. It was, it was, doesn't make sense. Uh, some Don't pe- think too hard about it. There was a lot of criticism about to change. The most notably the biggest criticism was Captain America's A on his hat went to an eagle because Liefeld thought it didn't look cool with an A, thought it was cheesy. I would argue that Liefeld's drawing of it was cheesy. Yeah, that was the problem. Yeah, he has Captain America with the boobs. Also, another major criticism was that at the time, Ron Garney and Mark Wade had revitalized Cap cells, and they were actually on the increase before mm. canceling, and they were not allowed to come over and work on the new book. So mm. it was like, hey, good job, guys, but go fuck yourself. Um, now, one bright spot, I guess you could say, for them is under Marvel or under Wildstorm, the title saw good sales. Yeah. Um, 
there was also a rumor that Marvel wanted him to continue under the condition that Lee draw at least one title. Because for those that don't know, he's arguably great, the greatest comic book artist of all yeah. time. Um, he refused because he didn't want to draw at the time. He was busy running his company. Uh, eventually, Franklin would use all of his uh, kitty powers to save the characters and bring them back under the House of Ideas in a miniseries called Heroes Reborn, The Return. Uh, some people, I didn't know this at the time. I didn't even think of this. But for some reason, part of Heroes Reborn, The Return, She-Hulk and the Inhumans came back, even though they had never left in the first place. Yeah, yeah But they weird. were touted as being part of it. Uh, following storylines were dubbed Heroes Return. Uh, the book would eventually be revisited again in 2006 in the very underrated series called The Exiles, which I loved. Um, the only real good that came out of all of this was in 2006, there was an event called Onslaught Reborn, in which yeah. Onslaught, because you had to take the two things from 96, yep. he would go into a similar Franklin verse looking place. Um, and the only reason that was good is all the proceeds or part of the proceeds from the sales of those books would go to the new, newly formed scholarship in honor of Loeb's deceased son, Sam, who right before Sam died, drew, wrote an issue of Superman, Batman. Oh, okay. He died of cancer. So mm. that was good. Um, I know you didn't read it, but just by what you know of it, just go ahead and give your knee jerk reaction. I'll give it a two because it doesn't sound fun. Two is a good rating, good, strong rating. I'll give it a two because there was some, still some art that was average on it. I mean, okay. it was cool to see. Lee draw Fantastic Four, um, but I'm gonna. The subtract- Wildstorm characters look super cool. Like, yeah, yeah. I, here, let me revise my review. I'm gonna or my rating. I'm gonna give it a five because of Lee's art, and then I'm gonna subtract a three due to Liefeld's art. Yeah, and then take it down to a two because why did Wildstorm have to cross over in it anyway? So yeah. it's a two. It's a solid two for me. That, that math checks out. I'll never read it again. I'll okay. never do anything other than look at it again. In fact, you will never see me utter the words "Heroes Reborn" or see any variation of that until yeah. tomorrow when I post the Instagram picture. There you go. Um, very bad. Just bad. That was the ugly. Yeah, I agree. I think this was a... 96 was a... DC had a pretty good year in 1996. Yeah. They put That's out the some, way I'll put it up. DC put out some good books. Yeah. And Marvel Everybody was else there. Just, yeah. Uh, Marvel would, like we said, Marvel would go on to file bankruptcy. Uh, Toy Biz, I believe it was a Toy Biz that, that our, our, one of the toy companies came in to buy them up uh, before they... Yes. And ended up, uh, obviously, there were some things like the movies would end up going to save them. Yes. Uh, but it's some other things about 1996. Um, Preacher was hitting its stride in 96. Mm-hmm. It, it, and it was my favorite ongoing book at the time. And uh, there's just no way around it. It's still one of my favorite books ever. That uh, is a book that, yeah, you should go and read in, uh, if you're an adult. If you're under 18, don't read it. <laughs> Here's some of the like, don't th- let your kids read it. Here's some of the things that uh, Jay said uh, as a, in his, or his kind of companion piece to our podcast. Okay. He talked about Spawn Overload, uh, where Spawn was for the top ten comics sold. We talked about that wasn't necessarily the truth. He, he talked at length a little bit about the downfall of Marvel. And this is something you can go to his website and read all this. It's worth reading. Uh, he did mention the crossovers. Uh, and it didn't end at DC and Marvel. It also had Spawn Wildcats. Medieval Spawn, Witchblade, Wolverine, Deathblow. I do remember Medieval Spawn. Grifter and She from uh, uh, William Tucci. Um, and the crossover trend continued. Marvel and Top Cow, Devil's Reign and Marvel. I mean, those, you know, it, it was ad, ad nauseum. He put some of the thing, notable first appearances. Also, uh, John Hardigan when Sin City would go on to be Bruce Willis in the movie. Yep. Um, he did say Aztec, which was awesome. Uh, Painkiller Jane, which I believe is a... Uh, Jimmy Palmati, who was the inker for um, Joe Quesada all those years. Okay. And he says his uh, three best stories of the year, he thought, in addition to Kingdom Come that we talked about, he put Marvel versus DC number two, so we'll have to overlook him for that. Yeah. Uh, but he also mentioned one of the ones I wanted to point out interesting was Star Wars Shadow of the Empire. Um, there was stuff little, little going on in the way of Star Wars at the time. Definitely nothing going on movie-wise, but... That Timothy Zahn books that would lead to this comic book and would go on to put that great video game during N64, Shadows of the Empire. Yep. And uh, so so it was worth talking about. It, it spawned some action figures, you know, back before they cannibalized the uh, extended universe. Yep. Um, but it was pretty, that's a pretty good note. Um, and yeah, so so check him out. It's, it's a very good read. Like I said, it's uh, nerdcast.com. We should uh, with the bring y. him on for the next year. Maybe we do. Maybe we see what he says. Well, we can just keep it us. That doesn't matter. We, we can do whatever we fucking want. It's our podcast. No. 
Uh, any other parting thoughts on 1996 from you? No, I really cannot stress enough. If you haven't read Kingdom Come, you will. Even if you're not in a huge comic book fan, I think you would just in- enjoy the story of hope. Uh, it's fun to go back. Like I said, I'm not a huge DC fan, so it's fun to go back and look through the pages and be like, "Who's that guy?" Like, uh, you know, like all these background characters are just so beautifully drawn, and you want to go back and. Oh, yeah. 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 Dig into who each one of those characters is standing in the background is. The diner that the superhero diner that they go into that's shaped like the Justice, a Hall of Justice. And then there's all kinds of cool stuff. Well, like, uh, uh, what is the guy, uh, not Green Arrow, but the guy who wears red? That guy, uh, it's it's not Speedy. It's uh, Red Arrow? Red. Is it Red Arrow? I don't know. Speedy was uh, his sidekick that wore red. Yeah, I think it's Speedy. Yeah, like Speedy. Like all these guys just sitting in the background. You're like, oh, yeah. I know that guy from. The, if you watch the CW shows, you'll recognize. Wizard even some had of the a outfits. great deal where they took those panels and they broke down like little dots and told you who yeah. everybody was. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I believe we should probably mention more about Wizard. Wizard's '96 was. They get a lot of shit and a lot of flack. They kind of guided the industry when it didn't need to be. Fans kind of believed everything Wizard said, yeah. and that kind of hurt sales. Um, you know, people were rushing to buy comics at, because they were going up. There's a great little Calvin and Hobbes sketch or, or thing where it said uh, Calvin's got like or uh, Calvin's got like five copies of a book, and he goes, "I look what I just got. It's going to be a collector's issue." He goes, "If it's collector," Hobbes says, "If it's a collector's issue, why do you have five? He because Kids like me have to hope kid other kids' parents eventually throw them away. Yeah. I mean that was just yeah. I mean that that sums up the '90s with anything that collectible baseball cards, yeah. football cards. Oh, yeah, '90s was any awful. of that. Was we just, had expendable incomes apparently, and we like yeah. to buy a lot of shit. I mean, it was just the lot of corporate influence on anything that you pop culture in the sports world. Well, then let's wrap up. Uh, before we wrap up, though, let's encourage, like I said, people to participate by asking questions, sharing your thoughts, argue. Call us retarded for some of the things we say. I, although I think this is a pretty solid episode. I don't think they can get anything. I don't think they one. can, too. I think I challenge them to try and find something. Yeah. You know, probably, Go for they it. probably are going to argue that it was the gouache that was used on uh, – Kingdom Come. It is gouache. It is a water-based media, but it's not a watercolor. Because if you okay, saw, you're tr- right, you're right, you're right. Yeah, because if you saw true watercolor, you'd be like, "Ain't no way anybody can paint that watercolor. detail." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just uh, tweet us at PC Bombcast with the hashtag for this episode TYIC 1996. Say whatever you have to say. Uh, tweet us some ideas for upcoming years. I don't have one unless you've got an idea right now. Not yet. Nothing set in stone. Next week or two, we'll probably end up seeing it out, so we give ourselves a good three yeah. or four weeks of research and reading yeah. and do it, and then we'll do this all over again. So all of that having been said, John, let's sign off and say goodbye. Hold on to your butts. And we hope you enjoyed the year that was in comics, 1996. Uh, we'll see you soon. 